Hello, everyone. You're watching Eagle News America. I'm Thomas High Leichner's broadcasting from our studio in Edmonton, Canada. It's Sunday, July the 18th, 2021 on this side of the world. And a good Monday morning, magandang umaga to our viewers in the Philippines. In the news, we have updates from all across North America. Joining us live this evening, Jane Kathleen Gregorio in Corpus Christi, Texas, brings us a couple of stories. Texas hosts Florida Governor DeSantis for a border security briefing, and the governor calls for Texas House Democrats to return to the state capitol. We'll also have reports from Rose Papa Angelus. She'll update us on the annual status of cancer report that's just been released. Bureau Chief Philip Toledo reports on how Atlanta plans to address the crime wave in that city. In Union Township, New Jersey, Bureau Chief Carlo Valdez reports about the closure of a decades-old snack food plant. In Las Vegas, Lori Jarvina tells us COVID cases are on the rise in southern Nevada and people are being urged to wear masks. For EBC Food, a couple of trips to the kitchen. Elise Danielle shares us with us her quick and easy recipe for fresh spring rolls. And Ika Ira in Sacramento invites us into her kitchen as she prepares her version of strawberry icebox cake. For World Emoji Day, we asked our EBC friends what their favorite emojis are and why. And for tonight's roundtable, we'll still stick with the theme of World Emoji Day. If we were to create our own emojis, what would they be? Our coverage begins now. We have calamities worldwide, fire and rain. Fire first. We begin with coverage of flames spreading through the forests of the western United States and parts of Canada. Fires are scorching vast areas of Oregon, Northern California, Washington State, Nevada, Montana, and the provinces of Col British Columbia and Ontario in Canada. The bootleg fire in Southern Oregon appears to be the worst right now. More than 2,100 firefighters are trying to contain it. Now, this fire is huge. It's, it's bigger than New York City. It covers 274,000 acres and is still growing. The perimeter of the blaze, 200 miles, that's 320 kilometers. More help is on the way from California, which is dealing with its own blazes. Now, up in Ontario, Canada, more than 100 firefighters from Mexico are on their way there to help put down flames in that province. Dry weather has left forests dry and parched. Lightning strikes are sparking more blazes. Thousands of people in both countries have been forced from their home. Areas not affected directly by the fires are plagued by heavy smoke in the air. What's needed now is several days of cooler temperatures and steady rain, but unfortunately, that is not in the forecast. But there has been a lot of water in the forecast in Europe and India. The cleanup has begun after flooding in Western Europe claimed more than 180 lives, at least 156 of them in Germany. German police expect that death toll from the heavy rains last week to rise. Many in Germany are critical of the government. They say they didn't receive adequate warning of the torrential rains. They say they were caught off guard by rapidly rising waters that destroyed roads, bridges, and homes. Too much water, also a problem in India. Monsoon rains have claimed lives, at least 23 in the country's financial capital of Mumbai. The rains triggered a landslide that caused a wall to collapse. Building collapses are common during the monsoon season. Rainwater has also flooded a water purification plant and that's disrupted the supply of drinking water in parts of Mumbai. No word on when that problem will be fixed. People are being told to boil water before using it. Well, what's happening with COVID-19? Let's, let's start in the United States where case numbers are on the increase. Deaths are up more than 25% in the last week. And the Surgeon General, his name, Dr. Vivek Murthy, Dr. Murthy, 
warning that social media may be hazardous to your health. He's blaming platforms like Facebook for vaccine hesitancy in the United States. The misinformation that we're seeing comes from multiple sources. Yes, uh, there is disinformation that is coming from bad actors. But what is also important to point out is that much of the misinformation that is circulating online is often coming from individuals who don't have bad intentions, but who are unintentionally sharing information that they think might be helpful. And that's why in this advisory, uh, we make it very clear that among the things we're asking individuals to do is to pause before they share. Now, Facebook is quick to deflect any blame, the social media giant says. Well, according to its research, 85% of Facebook users, well, they have been or want to be vaccinated. But you know, that still leaves 15%. And that 15% still gives the virus plenty of room to thrive and mutate. And it's those mutations that keep the head of the World Health Organization awake at night. Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus warns that the battle against COVID-19, well, it's far from over, and he fears even more deadly variants. The committee has expressed concern that the pandemic is being mischaracterized as coming to an end when it's nowhere near finished. It has also warned about the strong likelihood for the emergence and global spread of new and possibly more dangerous variants of concern that may be even more challenging to control. And you know, in just a few short hours, England will be lifting most of its health restrictions. Lawrence Young, who's a professor of molecular oncology, says this is just not the time to be doing this. It is likely from all the modeling work that we will reach over 100,000 cases um, a day come early August. That could result in more than 2,000 hospitalizations a day and possibly 200 deaths a day. These are smaller numbers than, 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 than we've that we've had previously in the United Kingdom, but significant enough not only to cause a lot of personal uh, problems, of course, for people getting sick, but also to put, create additional pressure on our National Health Service. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he won't delay removing restrictions. He says waiting until the fall would be worse because the winter weather, well, that would give the virus an advantage while people spend most of their time indoors. He's telling people, though, to be responsible, be cautious. Johnson himself will be in isolation for the next week. That's because his health minister tested positive for COVID and Johnson was exposed. In Asia, there's another COVID concern, the Tokyo Olympics. Will the games become a super spreader of COVID in that country? So far, two athletes have tested positive for the coronavirus in the Olympic Village. Now, these are the first cases to be spotted in the complex that houses the athletes. Almost 7,000 of them are going to be living there during the games. And there are fears there could be a cluster of cases just days before the opening ceremonies. Olympic officials downplaying the infection. They say everything's under control. You know, the games are unpopular in Japan. There's even been protests. Public opinion polls show little support from the average system, as citizen rather. They question, why are they going ahead, given the presence of more contagious variants? So far this month, 55 cases have been linked to the games, including four athletes. Let's look at today's COVID-19 numbers now, provided by the Coronavirus Resource Center of Johns Hopkins University in Medicine. As of 6 p.m. Eastern time today, the number of cases of COVID-19 reported worldwide, now more than 190,277,000. Top three on the list of countries with recorded cases, the United States, more than 34 million, India, more than 31 million, and Brazil, more than 19.3 million. Sadly though, more than 4 million, 86,000 people have lost their lives to this virus. Top three countries with the most number of COVID-19 related deaths, the United States, more than 609,000, Brazil, more than 441,000, and India reports more than 
413,000 people have died from COVID-19. The number of COVID vaccine uh, doses administered worldwide now topping more than 3 billion 618 million. Well, when will American tourists be able to visit Canada again? You know, the land border between the two countries has been closed to non-essential traffic since March 21st of last year. That's almost a year and a half. That closure has been extended every month since. The latest deadline to reopen is Wednesday, but what will happen then? The Canadian government says it will announce new travel measures tomorrow, but it's stopping short of indicating the border will reopen. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau saying he would like to allow fully vaccinated Americans into the country, but by the middle of next month. And perhaps by fall, maybe we could welcome foreign tourists from other countries, provided they're fully vaccinated. So if you're thinking about visiting here, I'd hold off for a day or so before making your plans to see just when Trudeau plans to take the welcome mat out of storage. Renewable energy in Singapore being produced by a floating solar farm. That's right, floating solar farm. Solar panels covering the area of 45 football fields are floating in the Tenga Reservoir. And if you plan to count them, plan on spending some time at it. There's 122,000 panels in this array. 122,000. This solar farm can produce up to 60 megawatts of electricity, and that's enough to power Singapore's five water treatment plants. The city-state says the solar farm will result in a reduction of carbon emissions equal to taking 7,000 cars off the road. Singapore is among the biggest per capita carbon dioxide emitters in Asia. You know, the scarcity of land in that city-state makes building renewable energy sources a challenge. Singapore is hoping to quadruple the number of solar energy production uh, over the next four years. Up next, we have stories from Washington, D.C. and Texas. Eagle News America continues. Factual. We have to defeat the virus everywhere. Timely information. Balanced. Not only in the country, but also abroad. I'm certain of one thing. Interviews that people need to know. Watch Aguila Pilipinas. A one-hour newscast of reports coming from regional hubs in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Know the important updates in Asia in ASEAN in Focus. Track the latest stories in the provinces in Aguila, Provincia. Tune into Mata ng Aguila, the evening primetime news program of Net25. Balanced and objective, Mata ng Aguila covers national and international issues, tackles news on business, health, science, and technology, entertainment, sports and human interest features and current events and eagle news international On delivers the latest lines. global reports impartial accessible and up-to-date it brings to four ebc's rich international scope and access to valuable information streams well thank you catch these programs on net 25 you can also watch our news programs through eaglenews.ph and Eagle News Facebook page and YouTube channel. some optimism in the latest status of cancer report in the United States. Eagle News correspondent Rose Papa Angelus has the details. Thank you. 
The latest annual report to the nation on the status of cancer indicates that overall cancer death rates continue to decline in men and women for all racial and ethnic groups in the United States. During 2001 to 2018, declines in lung cancer death rates accelerated and that rates for melanoma declined considerably in more recent years, reflecting a substantial increase in survival for metastatic melanoma. However, the report finds that for several other major cancers, including prostate, colorectal, and female breast cancers, previous declining trends in death rates slowed or disappeared. The report, appearing in Gen NCI, or the Journal of the National Cancer Institute, also finds that overall cancer incidence rates continue to increase among females, children, and adolescents, and young adults, or AYA. All trends in this report cover the period before the COVID-19 pandemic. The annual report is a collaborative effort among the American Cancer Society, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the National Cancer Institute, part of the National Institute of Health and the North American Association of Central Cancer Registries. The report shows a decrease in death rates for 11 of the 19 most common cancers among men and for 14 of the 20 most common cancers among women over the most recent period, 2014 to 2018. Although declining trends in death rates accelerated for lung cancer and melanoma over this period, previous declining trends for colorectal and female breast cancer death rates slowed and those for prostate cancer leveled off. Death rates increased for a few cancers like brain and other nervous system and pancreas in both sexes, oral cavity and pharynx in males and liver and uterus in females. Chief Executive Officer of the American Cancer Society, Karen E. Knudsen, says the declines in lung cancer and melanoma death rates are the results of progress across the entire cancer continuum, from reduced smoking rates to prevent cancers, to discoveries such as targeted drug therapies and immune checkpoint inhibitors. She says while we celebrate the progress, we must remain committed to research patient support and advocacy to make even greater progress to improve the lives of cancer patients and their families. The report finds that overall cancer death rates decrease in every racial and ethnic group during 2014 to 2018. Director of CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, Karen Hacker, says it is encouraging to see a continued decline in death rates for many of the common cancers. She says to dismantle existing health disparities and give everyone the opportunity to be as healthy as possible. We must continue to find innovative ways to reach people across the cancer care continuum from screening and early detection to treatment and support for survivors. However, increases in cancer incidence and death rates or deceleration of previous declining trends for some other cancers, such as colorectal and female breast cancers, are likely due to risk factors such as obesity. Currently, it is 82 degrees Fahrenheit or 28 degrees Celsius here in the nation's capital. In Washington, D.C., Rose Papa Angeles, Eagle News will live in interesting times. Back to you. Border security will top the agenda when the governor of Texas meets with his Florida counterpart. EBC Texas Bureau Chief Jane Kathleen Gregorio joins us live now from Corpus Christi with more on that story as well as other news from the Lone Star State. Glad to have you on the program, Jane Kathleen. Thank you, Thomas, and howdy again from the Lone Star State. On Saturday, Governor Abbott hosted Florida Governor Ron DeSantis for a border security briefing in Del Rio, Texas, where Governor Abbott shared updates on Texas' efforts to combat the vast increase of drugs, weapons, and other contraband smuggled into the state. Governor Abbott also thanked the Florida governor for responding to the Emergency Management Assistant Compact by sending Florida law enforcement officers to assist Texas border security efforts. Both governors were joined by Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, Florida Attorney General Ashley Moody, and other state and local officials. 
In other news, it has almost been one week since more than 50 Texas House Democrats fled Texas and headed for Washington, D.C. last Monday in a high-profile effort to block passage of the GOP-backed voting restrictions. This resulted in the breaking of a quorum, which is the minimum number of lawmakers needed to conduct business to prevent Republicans from passing legislation that could ban drive through and 24-hour voting and require voters to provide their driver's license number or the last four digits of their social security number on applications for mail-in and return ballots, among other restrictions. The Democrats' move garnered criticism from Republican officials who stated they would do all they could to compel the Democrats back to Austin. Meanwhile, Democrats hope to use the national attention to advocate for federal voter protections. Governor Abbott issued the following statement regarding the departures of the Democrats Monday, stating, Texas Democrats' decision to break a quorum of the Texas legislature and abandon the Texas state capitol inflicts harm on the very Texans who elected them to serve. As they fly across the country on cushy private planes, they leave undone issues that can help their districts and our state. Issues like property tax relief, funding to support sheriffs and law enforcement in high crime areas, funding for children in foster care, and funding for retired teachers. Meanwhile, Texas House Speaker Dade Fillan said the House will use every available resource under the Texas Constitution and the unanimously passed House rules to secure a quorum to meaningfully debate and consider the bills that were on the agenda. The, he stated the special sec session clock is ticking. I expect all members to be present in our Capitol in order to immediately get work on, done on these issues. The House Democrats also received support from Vice President Kamala Harris, who praised the Democrats, saying they were showing extraordinary courage and commitment. She also mentioned, I applaud them for standing for the rights of all Americans and all Texans to express their voice through their vote unencumbered. Stay tuned to Eagle News for further updates. In Corpus Christi, Texas, I'm Jane Kathleen Gregorio. Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Back to you, Thomas. Jane Kathleen, on a positive note, I heard that maybe I should go down there. I'm looking for work. On a positive note, I heard employment is on the rise there in Texas. Is that true? Yes. As a matter of fact, on Friday, Governor Abbott stated that Texas employers have added 55,800 jobs over the month, marking job growth in 13 of the last 14 months, as the unemployment rate has dropped to 6.5% as more Texans jump back into the job market. Thomas? So what kind of resources uh, is, is the state making available to job seekers? Well, uh, for job seekers, uh, they can also apply for uh, child care financial assistance, as sometimes that's the issue when trying to go back to work is trying to find who can care for your children. And uh, qualified Texans may receive help for child care while job hunting or by enrolling on the Texas Workforce Commission's child care subsidy program. There's also 5,000 free classes that are available online to help Texans brush up on their skills, like resume, writing help. There's also, uh, because of the, uh, you know, the the pandemic affecting the restaurant industry. There is also restaurant jobs training and also free job hunting programs and services for Texans with physical or cognitive disabilities, which include blindness or visual impairment, and also assistance for veterans. Thomas? Before I let you go, Jane Kathleen, where can people go to find out more information on this? Excellent question. Where for job postings, there are more than 930,000 available jobs on the 866,000 postings online at mytxcareer.com. And for the free services that I mentioned earlier, uh, users can also go to workintexas.com. Thomas? Stick around, Jane Kathleen, and we'll talk emojis when we meet at the round table, okay? Still to come, we have stories from Georgia, New Jersey, and Atlanta. This is Eagle News America. Innovation. Digital disruption. Globalization. Startups, micro, small, and medium enterprises, as well as large corporations, all face interesting challenges in the market today. 
peek into the world of exciting opportunities and partnerships to drive growth with the latest business news and information. We are open for business. Your weekly dose of entrepreneurial inspiration to update you on the latest developments in the world of business. Get up close and personal with CEOs and thought leaders to help you discover valuable insights Sharpen your instincts for smart decision-making with the latest markets and economic trends, disruptive ideas, global innovation, social entrepreneurship, and other leading-edge business ideas. Join the conversations to create a more vibrant environment for entrepreneurship. Catch Open for Business from Vision to Action. Watching Eagle News America, I'm Thomas I. Likeness. In Atlanta, the crime rate has skyrocketed in the last couple of years. EBC's Philip Toledo tells us what steps the city plans to take to address that problem. Thanks. Since the first quarter of 2019 until first quarter 2021, homicides in large cities have risen 60%. And the city of Atlanta is no exception, according to a recent report released by a special advisory council created by Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. The council, which has had 45 days to deliberate, released a report last week detailing three main recommendations to address a rise in violent crime in the city, which saw a 54% increase in homicides and a 23% increase in aggravated assaults during the COVID-19 pandemic. The three main recommendations are the creation of a dedicated mayor's office of violence reduction, nine separate initiatives focused on the location and individuals affected by violence, affected by violence, and an overall investment into those programs of $70 million. According to the press release, the nine critical initiatives for violence reduction include public awareness, community capacity and infrastructure building, expansion of programs focused on violence prevention, local security planning, a focus on violent repeat offenders, increased enforcement of nuisance properties, hiring 250 additional officers, expanding the city's Operation Shield camera network by 250 cameras this year, and completing the One Atlanta Light Up the Night program to install 10,000 new streetlights in high violence areas by December. Mayor Bottoms also discussed the involvement of the Biden administration in her press conference. Take a look. I want to also thank the Biden administration. Uh, the Biden administration has been a solid partner with us in this work. Uh, when I visited the White House in March with several governors and mayors from across the country, as we talked about COVID-19, it was at that time uh, one of the many times that I've had the opportunity to elevate this concern to our president and to his administration, what we were seeing in the aftermath of COVID and the unrest that we had last summer. Unfortunately, we had a preview before many other cities uh, because our state was open and there were many people uh, coming into our cities, coming into our city. Um, so we were starting to see an uptick in crime before many other major cities. Um, and unfortunately, what we saw was just not something happening in Atlanta. Uh, we've seen it spread throughout the country as other cities have reopened. And with the leadership of the Biden administration, uh, you all are aware of the announcement that was made uh, last month that Atlanta would join 14 other jurisdictions for a community violence intervention collaborative. Now for a quick COVID-19 stats update before we go. The state is currently around 910,000 cases since the pandemic began. And the daily new case count is starting to show an upward trend from a low in June. Experts are worried as only 39% of the state is fully vaccinated, which was the same amount that we reported on last week as progress has been slow. In Atlanta, Georgia, Philip Toledo, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Back to you. Well, for more than six decades, 
A factory in New Jersey has been making snack foods that are familiar to Americans. As Eagle News correspondent Carlos Vildez reports, Nabisco is closing the door of the plant that makes favorites such as Ritz crackers and Oreo cookies. Thank you. The makers of Oreos, Ritz crackers, Lorna Dune, and Telegrams, Nabisco or parent company Mondelez International confirmed it was their last day on Friday at the Fairlawn, New Jersey factory. A statement from the company said, both Fairlawn and Atlanta are no longer strategic assets from a geographic footprint perspective and both face significant operational challenges, including aging infrastructure and outdated production capabilities, which would have required significant investment to bring them to the modernized state required for the future. Their Atlanta factory closed in June, but the remaining factory remains open in Richmond, Virginia. And as for coronavirus stats and numbers, New Jersey reports of 400 35 new positive PCR tests, pushing the total to 897,926. Sadly, New Jersey is reporting three new confirmed deaths, pushing the total to 23,823 lives lost. In Union Township, New Jersey, Carlo Valdez, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Back to you. A growing number of COVID cases in Southern Nevada, coupled with vaccine hesitancy, has health officials in the state concerned. With more on that story, EBC's Lori Jarvina. Thank you and greetings to all our viewers in America and abroad. I hope everyone is safe and healthy out there. The pandemic continues to remain the top health concern around the world and various locations that were optimistic of putting the worst behind them now see another surge in COVID-19 cases. Here in Las Vegas, there's concerning news of another wave and a return to increased precautions. According to the Southern Nevada Health District on Friday, COVID-19 case counts and their positivity rate continues to increase in our community. So the agency is now recommending both unvaccinated and vaccinated people wear masks in crowded indoor public places where they may have contact with others who are not fully vaccinated. In Clark County, where Las Vegas is, cases are rising while vaccination rates are slowing. As health officials often remind us, using masks correctly has proven to be effective in helping to prevent people from getting and spreading COVID-19. The health district's recommendation to wear masks in crowded public settings, including grocery stores, malls, large events, and casinos is a step to fully utilize the tools we have available to stop the pandemic. In addition to wearing face masks, the agency and its partners continue to offer COVID-19 vaccines and testing throughout the community. The COVID-19 vaccine has been proven to be an effective step people can take to protect themselves and others from COVID-19. All Nevadans ages 12 and older are eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccine, which are free and available at Southern Nevada Health District and community partner locations throughout Las Vegas and Clark County. Reports from health officials show as of Friday, there are currently 539 new daily cases for a 14-day moving average in Nevada as compared to 132 daily average in June. That's an average increase of over 400 new daily cases. The state has a total of 343,096 cumulative cases. Clark County, the most populous region of Nevada, with over 2.3 million residents, has a total of 268,514 cases, with 45% of the population 12 years old and older fully vaccinated, but 55% have initiated vaccinations. Over the weekend, Nevada's Governor Steve Sislak attended a vaccination clinic called Viva Vax Vegas, held at the Park MGM on Saturday. Immunize Nevada sponsored the event, which continued to promote vaccinations and featured live entertainment, special guests, and prize drawings. Governor Sisolak said that 98% of Nevada's COVID-19 hospitalizations and all of its deaths are people who aren't vaccinated. He also stated that although control is delegated to the local jurisdictions, the 17 counties in Nevada, Clark County has decided they have to crack down a little bit more 
tighten it up because over 90% of the cases are currently in Clark County. Today's forecast is partly cloudy, scattered thunderstorms, and flash flood warnings, with a high of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius and a low of 79 degrees Fahrenheit. In Las Vegas, Nevada, Lori Jarvina, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Up next, EBC Food and tonight's roundtable, World Emoji Day. You're watching Eagle News America. Events happen around us all the time, in our community, in our country, around the world. Events that affect people, move communities, or simply inspire us. Interesting events that people need to know in these interesting times. We continue to be a competent partner in delivering news about these events. Fast, accurate, balanced. Eagle News, because we live in interesting times. Ang trabaho naman talaga ng uh, maritime uh, group ng PNP is to enforce the maritime laws. Ayaw lang yung stricto, pero in other parts of the country, pwede na naman ang tourism. But definitely, uh, we are ready to respond to uh, to a possible smite. Uh, sapagat ang aming intensyon ay makatulong lang sa mga tao na wala talagang magamit na gamot. 92 voted for this resolution, which will make it stronger, calling on the Justice Department to come up with more stringent uh, ways to be able to avert these hate crimes against Asian Americans. Mas marami po tayong magagamit ngayon na mga tools or mga equipment. Maraming maraming salamat, Weng, at sa buong pwersa ng balita lang kaya, no, sa pagkakataong ito. Tapakakay na mga pangunahing balita, live sa Teleradyo ng Net25 at Radyo Aguila DCEC 1062. Kasama si Weng de la Fuente sa Balit Talakayan! We live in interesting times. Hungry? We're going to spend a little time in the kitchen now learning a couple of recipes. First, EBC friend Elise Danielle shares her quick and easy fresh spring roll recipe. goodness half those look great they, they look great and after a plate of spring rolls you know i'm ready for some dessert 
So let's join EBC's Ika Ira in her kitchen to find out how she makes her version of strawberry icebox cake. Well, with July 17th being World Emoji Day, we asked our EBC friends what their favorite emojis are and why. And this is what they told us. My favorite emoji is the laughing emoji because I use it very often. My favorite emoji is, is the dinosaur. dinosaur. I say you roar like Godzilla. And he is my friend and happy. Why? Mommy is happy. He is happy. Yay! My favorite emoji is the LOL emoji because it is very funny. It can be used in a lot of different conversations and a lot of people know it. My favorite emoji is the poop emoji because... First of all, I have a hat, and it's funny and it's gross. My favorite emoji is a heart smile because it makes me happy. Hi, so my favorite emoji is the heart. I also find myself using it often and I believe I do that because I just want to make sure everyone knows or whoever I am talking to, texting, um, knows that I'm doing it and saying things with care and with love. My favorite emoji is the purple alien monster because I'm able to use that one when I'm texting and I see something that is kind of weird or out of this world, you know, <laughs> funny or cool. Also, my favorite color is purple, so that emoji just holds something special in my heart. When I, <laughs> when I don't know how to describe a situation, I just put alien emoji. Weird. <laughs> I love using the smile emoji because it expresses happiness and cheerfulness. My favorite emoji would have to be the relieved face emoji. Uh, whenever, you know, I greet people through text, I like to use this emoji when I'm happy or when I'm smiling. Uh, it kind of shows not just happiness, but for me, peacefully happy. You know, it's a very uh, gentle smile, um, very comforting, uh, very calm. So, yeah. My favorite emoji is hearts because everyone loves meatball. My favorite emoji is the happy emoji is because I'm always happy. My favorite emoji is the red heart emoji because for me, it means love. And whenever I use this, it feels like sending my love to my family and friends. My favorite emoji is the dog emoji because the, it, the dog emoji kind of looks like Thor, but it's a yellow lab, but still counts. My favorite emojis are the rainbow. Because I love the colors and they're so cute. I like using the blushing emoji 
actually because I think I look like a professional. My favorite money is the the Latin one because he laughs a lot. My favorite My favorite emoji is the upside down face emoji. I use it when things don't go my way because it reminds me that even if it feels like I got turned upside down, as long as I got a smile, everything is okay. My favorite emoji is the smile. I love to see everyone happy. Hey everyone. My favorite emoji is definitely the blushing smiling emoji. I just think it's so cute and I use it all the time. Also, I think it's pretty accurate representation of the happiness I get when I'm able to text my friends and family, and I just use it to show them that they make me so happy and that hopefully I can give them a little smile when they look at that emoji too. My favorite emoji is the one that goes like this, because I feel that it's universal for everything. If you're happy, if something's funny, then it's a good emoji to use. My favorite emoji is the smiling face with hands um, because it shows that, hi, hello, I'm happy to text you. So we're going to continue with the theme of World Emoji Day. And I you know for me, this has been a bit of an education because I'll be honest with you. I don't use them because I really didn't understand them. So in doing uh, some research for World Emoji Day, I found out that uh, uh, emojis were, uh, be be before emojis, there was something called emoticons. Didn't know anything about those either. Uh, they were developed as an expression of emotions in uh, the cold hard texts, texts that were devoid of them. Emoji is a Japanese expression. It, it, it roughly means picture word and they were created by a fellow by the name of Shigetaka Karita way back in 1990. He was working for a, a Japanese telecom company and he designed these picture words as a feature on their pagers to make them more appealing to teens. And with the uh, the first release of the iPhone uh, back in 2007, it had an emoji keyboard for the Japanese market. It wasn't intended for American users to find, but they did quickly figured out uh, how to use them. Uh, well, just about everybody did, I didn't. Uh, and, and every year, new emojis, both emojis and uh, 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 emoji and emojis are acceptable in the plural forms, uh, uh, but new ones are developed every year. There's something called the Emojipedia, which I'm gonna look up. Uh, the Emojipedia, it keeps track of all the emoji updates across all platforms and operating systems. Maybe I can find out what they mean. Uh, they got them for everything, not just emotions, transportation, food, an assortment of wild and domesticated animals, social platforms, weather, you name it, they got it. But I want to find out from our team what their favorite emoji is, why that is, and um, we'll, we'll ask them some other questions as well. But we'll begin with you, Jane Kathleen. What's your favorite emoji? You're, you're, you're muted there. <laughs> oh, I should have used an emoji to... Uh... <laughs> exactly. I, I thought maybe uh, I missed something that that, that was an emoji. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, to answer your question, uh, I have two favorite. One is the monkey covering his eyes. The other one, I call this the awkward smiley because it's neither a... Um, well, go I see that you've posted the... Um, well, okay, there's the awkward smiley again. So mm -hmm. the awkward smiley is neither a smile nor is it a frown but it's just a straight line and i think it's hilarious like if you were to reply that emoji to somebody after they uh, made some sort of statement it's like you can't tell what what that means like could it be bad could it be positive uh, what could that mean it's very mysterious but i think it's i think it's just hilarious the monkey covering the eyes emoji i often use this because many times if i accidentally made a mistake or a typo or forgot uh, i forgot an appointment uh this is one i use a lot thomas 
Did, did you have any that you dislike uh, that you absolutely can't stand? Um, absolutely can't stand. That's that's an interesting one. Um, I, I I I really can't say that there's one that I can't stand only because um, I. I'm a, I, I believe in the variety of expressions. So I think uh, all emojis um, should have fair representation <laughs> depicting your emotions, Thomas. Let's, let's go to Georgia now and, and, and talk with Philip Toledo. Uh, good that you could join us uh, uh, for this round table tonight. Philip, uh, your favorite emoji and why? So Thomas, uh, and you know, glad glad to be with you tonight uh, for this uh, very interesting topic. I, I actually had to go to the uh, I have the emojipedia up over here because I wasn't sure how to describe like this face. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and it, I, I had to figure out. I had to scroll through everything to find out. Apparently, it's called the tired face, um, which is is exactly how I use it. Um, pretty frequently, lately especially. Um, it just always seems like a good response when someone asks, oh, how are you or what are you doing? And then, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm whatever, but I'm also extremely tired right now. <laughs> um, and apparently if you have an Apple device, um, it's also called the distraught face. So I, I tend to use this for a variety of feelings, whether it's tired or frustration or, you know, something's going on and I want to acknowledge, you know, whatever is, you know, happening. Um, and then there's this other one that, that just popped up on the screen. I'm glad I was able to get there because I don't know if these are my favorite emojis, but they're the ones that I use the most often. Um, and the face palm emoji, um, I usually use if I do something um, that I wish that I didn't, or if I am referring to a situation where maybe somebody else did something that, you um, I think they should have known better <laughs> than to not do. It's usually this one followed by the other one or vice versa. I tend to, to use them both a lot. Thomas? What, what, what about your most disliked emoji, Philip? Is, is, and, and also, is there any that you absolutely can't stand? Um, I, I'd have to say if I'm messaging with someone and they revert back to an emoticon with like the semicolon with the half parenthesis to smile or to not smile. Um, I'm like, there's a button for that. You didn't have to type both pieces of punctuation. You could have just done an emoji. Um, I, I guess that's the only thing, but you know, like, um, like, like Jane Kathleen, I, you know, I, I think all emojis have their place, especially now there's just so many different ones. Um, you know, you could have, uh, not that I'm necessarily skilled with this, but I know the young people that they can have whole conversations just with emojis. It's kind of interesting. And, and I have trouble figuring out a single one. Uh, let's go to the nation's capital now uh, and, and uh, talk with our producer, Eliza. What's your favorite emoji and, and, and why would that be? I have a couple, uh, Thomas. Uh, the first one is that I don't know if I'm calling it right. Uh, the exploding brain. Th this one, this, this one that you're seeing right now. I can relate so much to this one because uh, this is exactly how I feel whenever I'm under pressure, which is every day. <laughs> <laughs> but then um, after uh, after the pressure is gone and uh, everything has fallen into place. I feel like the next one, it's, I don't know if I, I'm calling it right, it's the sunglass wearing. <laughs> um, I suddenly feel as cool as that guy uh, when everything is uh, done at the end of the day. So uh, it's good. And also I like the, um, this one. There's an emoji for this one. I think it's the I love you hand gesture um, because uh, this reminds me of um, how our family say the three words when we're in public. So we don't have to verbally say it. And when we text each other, um, uh, we text this one. So it means I love you. <laughs> it, it, is, that, it, hmm? is there a dictionary or, or, or something? Because I, I wouldn't have a clue what uh, uh, some, some of the, the, the brain exploding, that one I can figure out. <laughs> but but the hand there, I wouldn't have a clue what that meant. It should be I, and then the L, and then the U. So it's like I okay. Know. But is there a dictionary or a chart or anything for for dinosaurs <laughs> like myself? 
<laughs> just then, no, you, you learn as you go along. The more you use it, Thomas, uh, the more uh, you get familiar with with the with the emojis. And 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 hopefully, don't offend too many people. Uh, are there any that you dislike? There are. Uh, I don't like. I, I'm sorry. I have to disagree with our EBC friend there earlier. The poop emoji. I can't stand it. <laughs> I don't think Philip likes that one too because it stinks. <laughs> and, uh, um, no and pun intended. <laughs> and the rat emoji, anything rodent, I can't handle. So no, no to those two. But other than that, I I, I find everything else cute. How about you, Thomas? Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But I I want to go around the table one more time and and say if you were to create a new emoji, what would it be? And why? Hmm. We'll start with you, Eliza. Um, okay. Maybe if I could create some, maybe more uh, uh, more Philippine fruits or fruits found in the Philippines. Because uh, there's a lot of fruit emojis, but not too many uh, of the tropical ones. So maybe those. And uh, anything cultural, like uh, a jeepney or, or, or a nipa hat or... or uh, what do you call this? The abanico. It's like a fan, a Philippine fan. So, yeah. <laughs> Philip, what say you? Uh, <laughs> I, it, it caught me off guard a little bit, Thomas. Uh, but I think it would be a variation on the one that I already said that I liked. But it would be, uh, I ate too much. Or whatever I ate is disagreeing with me right now. So like a transition from the face to uh, the emoji that we don't like, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen, I'm sure you've got at least a dozen ideas for emojis. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm always daydreaming. So I would um, make like an emoji with uh, like clouds circling above the head. So that would reflect like um, like you're in daydreaming mode or you have a lot of ideas or um, you're just spacey <laughs> or scattered, feeling scattered brain like me after a long day of work. That's a good one. The, the, uh, uh, you were asking me what my favorite emoji would be. I, I'm not sure because like I, you know, I, I, I see a lot of them. Uh, some of them I understand. I think though, if I were gonna create one, I, I would probably personalize it, and um, I don't know, it would be like a Tyrannosaurus Rex or a Stegosaurus, uh, something from the, the prehistoric dinosaur era, because <laughs> it kind of signifies where I'm at in this. I, and, and, and like I say, I've, 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 got to, I've, I've got to learn to, to use them, I guess, uh, because it's part of today's communication, which... Uh, which um, you know, sadly, when I uh, when I text, when I text, it's 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 simply to get a paper trail. Uh, if 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 I want to talk personally with somebody, um, I I have this gadget. You can talk into it, and they can talk back to you. And 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 I guess I'm still way back there. I I I, I don't know. Uh, uh, do you think it uh, quickly? Uh, does anybody think uh, the emojis take away from personal communication? That 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 we're just too much into to to graphics and not enough speech but there are times thomas that when you want to communicate to uh, communicate with someone and the, that person is not available then uh the only resort you have is either leave the person a voicemail or text text him or her so and sometimes there are words that you can't really uh, express or there are there uh, emotions you can't express through words but a, an emoji can uh, capture it and we're going to leave it there. But as we leave you tonight, I want to leave an emoji for all those out there on the front lines who have helped us through the pandemic, something that shows our appreciation for what they've had to endure. I, you know, I'm, I'm talking about our healthcare workers, first responders, essential workers of all types, everybody out there on the front lines. Let's, because I'm emoji illiterate, let's show our appreciation with a round of applause. We appreciate you. And that's today's Eagle News America. I want to thank you for joining us. I'm Thomas I. Likeness, and truly, we live in interesting times.